This is your host, Patrick Payandi, and welcome to History Talk, the history podcast for everyone, produced by Origins. And I'm Leticia Wiggins, your other host. Football season is well underway, and Ohio State is celebrating 125 years of Buckeye football. But the game has certainly changed since its inception, as has what the sport means for the players and their universities. Today, we are the only country in the world that plays big money sports at schools of higher learning, and this distinction is causing a recent stir with issues of players' rights and college finances. The National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA, is feeling the heat as players move to be seen as something other than, quote-unquote, amateur athletes. These are students who play for the love of the sport without any expectation of compensation, financial or otherwise. In today's show, we explore the distinct system of college sports in the United States, looking to how history informs the current plight of the college athlete and what this means for the NCAA financially. So stay tuned. This is Steve Kahn, and I'm a professor in the History Department at Ohio State, and I'm one of the editors of Origins, Current Events and Historical Perspective. Hi, my name is Anna McCullough. I'm an assistant professor of Latin and Roman history in the Department of Classics at The Ohio State University. And I research uh, modern interpretations of Greece and Rome in American culture. My name is Mark Horger, and I'm a lecturer in the history of American sport in the Human Sciences Department at Ohio State. So thanks for joining the show, everybody. Um, and it's great to have Mark and Steve back for the second time on the show together and Anna for the first time. Um, so here's a question that gets to the heart of it, and it's one for each of you. What would you consider the primary problem of college sports? And Steve, we'll throw this question to you first. The primary problem. i got to pick one. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how much time do we have here? Mm-hmm. You know, I, there are lots and lots of problems with college sports. Uh, but let me let me put my finger on one that I think has not gotten as much attention recently, certainly, as, as, as the court cases have been going on and, uh, and the conferences have been uh, making different moves. And that is the effect that college athletics has had on the rest of campus. Uh, we've talked a lot, I think, about whether or not the athletes themselves are being treated fairly or whether they're entitled to some kind of compensation. Players at Northwestern are looking into unionizing and so on and so forth. But I think what we've, what we've really missed or what's receded into the background is that what I see as the completely distorting effect that big-time college athletics has on the rest of the university. Ann and Mark, if you want to follow up. Um, well, I would – it seems to me there are sort of two categories of problem in college athletics right now, and it might be worth trying to separate them. One being the problem people have with the existence of college athletics on campus, which is, I think, the category of problem Steve is is interested in talking about. And the other one being um, the management of college athletics – uh, and the way that that has is changing recently uh, and is changing in ways that the people who run college athletics at the moment don't feel like they have very much control over because some of them are coming from the federal court system. Some of them are being driven by the outside commercial interests like television and the shoe companies. There's a kind of a, 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 so, a whole category of inside the sport problems and a whole category of, hey, wait a minute, why is this thing glued to the institution in the first place problems. I think a a couple of these different problems, however, um, especially the problem that you mentioned, Steve, uh, about its its effects on the rest of campus, I think a lot of that derives from a very basic lack of consensus or or at least lack of understanding of what it is amateurism means. Uh, There doesn't seem to be a decision or or consensus about the very definition of the term. Um, Dr. Mark Emmert, uh, the current president of the NCAA, in his testimony during the O'Bannon trial, um, at one point conceded that he didn't understand fully what amateur meant both to him and to the rest of American society. Um, Some people see that uh, you could grant for for example, stipends to athletes without compromising that that uh, that amateur definition. Um, others think that it could, you know, that would be an absolute corruption of the definition. Um, but if we can't agree on what college sports is for uh, and what constitutes a- an amateur, um, then uh, th- then it's hard not for it to uh, to have negative effects upon the rest of campus, um, or for unintended effects upon the rest of uh, uh, you know the the rest of the apparatus yeah, around yeah, it. Th- that's a great point, Anna, and and actually 
you, you touch on this uh, even more thoroughly in the piece you wrote for Origins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so not only do we not really know what amateurism means, uh, there's no consensus about a definition of that, but I also wonder if there isn't really any sense of why we're still hanging on to it anyway. Mm-hmm. Is, is this purely nostalgia or, uh, or, or, or sentimentality here? Mm-hmm. What is served by continuing to cling on to this notion that we're going to draw a sharp line between amateurs and professionals? We gave that up with the Olympics years mm-hmm. ago, uh, and yet somehow people like uh, Emmert at the NCAA uh, won't let this go. Well, this is a great segue to the next question we had, just to follow up um, on how we see these current problems with the NCAA, you know, such as this negative effect on campus, even this definition of amateurism that we're kind of clinging to, perhaps. So we're curious, is this a continuation or a departure from past disagreements or challenges in college sports history? And so, Mark, we'd like to pass this off to you. Um, it, it, difficult to know where to start on that one. Let me <laughs> try to do two things quickly. First of all, uh, the premise of amateurism, the idea that for sport to have some value other than just it's fun to play, it's fun to watch, the idea that for that to be true, it needs to be amateur has been embedded as far back as at least the 19th century in the Anglo-American tradition. It is as old as playing sports on campus uh, in the first place. Uh, And the second point I would make is that you always have to have between one and three layers of ironic quotation mark around the word amateur when you try to describe it, because (laughs) (laughs) it it has always been deeply important to the people uh, uh, responsible for amateur athletics, even as it falls apart at the slightest touch when you actually try to take that literally. I think we underestimate two things about Uh, about amateurism when we talk about it critically this way. One is that I think we underestimate the degree to which it remains a serious value to the people that are in the business of, of, you know, I don't think uh, the people who run the NCAA are are being hypocrites when they express their commitment to something that is integral to their sense of what it is they do, even though they can't articulate it very well. And the second point I would make uh, to try to connect this to uh, my earlier point about there being criticism of collegiate athletics versus uh, crisis in the way it's being managed. One of the reasons why amateurism has been so resilient in college athletics is because of the way it actually functions to people trying to put together uh, uh, teams, leaving aside whether or not we actually agree that amateurism is, is a, a real social value we can describe. One of the ways the NCAA rule book actually functions is that it prevents, at least in theory, Urban Meyer from offering anything in an 18-year-old uh, in an 18-year-old's living room that uh, that Elaine Kiffin can't offer. And the apparatus of amateurism, you know, the big thick rule book that that says where you can and can't buy kids meals and how often you can and can't call somebody and all of that actually on a day-to-day basis is, is functions as labor market controls for the people whose job it is to try to put together a team. Um, here at Ohio State a few years ago, uh, the football team uh, uh, lost a year or so to a, a, uh, a recruiting scandal that was relatively low stakes financially. It was related to free tattoos and some other kinds of favors. And the reason, one of the practical reasons the NCAA has to at least pretend to be aghast by that is because Alabama doesn't want Ohio State to offer anything that, that Alabama can't offer. Right. And, and one of the reasons, other than, than cultural confusion about the concept of amateurism, that I think explains why the people whose job it is to run these institutions are nervous right now, is that a, a federal judge may well throw a grenade in the idea that anybody can regulate what Coach A can or can't offer a kid relative to Coach B, because that's exactly the kind of, of antitrust premise that one of the current court cases is designed to address. And so, Anna, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for you to build on Mark's answer here. And we were wondering just what sorts of factors in popular culture, the rhetoric of sports, and perhaps in the university itself, that may lend themselves to promoting this concept of, you know, quote-unquote, amateur sports that Mark's talking about. 
Well, my answer to that would partially link to Mark's first point that he made about the sentimentality uh, or that these people who are who are uh, continuing to espouse amateurism are not technically hypocrites in the sense that they truly believe this, right? Um, and that stems from a very strong sense of sentimentality uh, and nostalgia about amateurism. Everybody who has played who played you know uh, uh, baseball uh, or or t ball as a child um, may have. Uh, uh, very strong memories of camaraderie or, you know, fun, getting pop after the games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they cling to that in, in some sense um, as amateur. But I think that there's, um, um, you know, even something deeper than that sentimentality for a, you know, lost age. Um, we all remember the movie The Sandlot or, or some most of us remember the movie The Sandlot, um, which is that um, it, in culture, in, in popular culture itself, uh, amateurism um, was first enshrined in the 19th century as a, an, a what became an aristocratic ideal, um, the idea that uh, that amateurs did this for the love of the game because it was sorted to be paid uh, for a living, right? Uh, and so, who can afford to do that? Um, you know, aristocratic gentlemen. Uh, that, that's part of where the amateur concept, the the modern concept of amateurism, comes from. Um, but uh, you know, it it. it, it it, it's acquired even more, um, I want to say, moral currency uh, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries because it's been rhetorically opposed to, uh, to the figure of the gladiator and Roman sport, Roman spectacle. So saying that you're an amateur, you know, automatically gives you uh, more moral, uh, gives you the moral high ground um, over somebody who's being paid, uh, over somebody uh, who's being uh, paid uh, in especially football, right, um, which is where a lot of these comparisons to gladiators happen. Um, so the idea that, that Rome equals professional and Greece equals amateur uh, and, and that somehow there is something more morally um, wholesome about being an amateur, well, sure, if you if you conjure up the specter of people disemboweling each other for entertainment, <laughs> right. of course, it's, go, uh, you know, it's going to it's going to sound better. And so uh, and, and so I think that that defending amateurism or claiming one's Self as an amateur um, still has uh, uh, some of that some of that moral cachet that was that was begun in the 19th century and continued well, through today. And, and Anna, w- w- would you go as far as to kind of graph this to say that that maybe precisely because everything else in the culture right now is so thoroughly commercialized uh, that mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. This amateur that, that this is part of why we hang on to this notion of amateurism because mm-hmm. because we can at least pretend on a Saturday afternoon that these guys are just playing for team spirit for the uh, love of the not, game yeah, yeah. yeah. no and, I, I and think, not for the fact that there's a there's a payoff here right I think that's absolutely right Stephen in fact uh, in in one of the uh, more um, prominent legal cases involving the NCAA Gaines versus NCAA uh, Judge uh, 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 Judge Wiseman talked about how he. Still Still believes that there is a virtue in the Athenian ideal yeah. of non-commercial <laughs> activity. Oh, amazing! Right. Okay. Right? So, um, so even if they, uh, you know, judges or moral co- or you know, commentators or sports media, even if they recognize that uh, that there is something wrong with the ideal of amateurism as implemented uh, by the NCAA, they still think that this is that, that there's some sort of abstract ideal of amateurism outside of that that is the last bulwark. Uh, uh, the last offense against the you know the evil forces of commercialism and professionalism and i think steve i would also be a little hesitant to think of it primarily as a problem of contemporary culture because of how far back we can push in history and find examples of exactly the same conversation yes uh, we all know that the complaints about the the corruption of college football in particular i, I don't really recall too many complaints about college field hockey um, but the <laughs> That that goes back at least a hundred years, and and really probably now a, a 125 years. And James Thurber, uh, Columbus's own, uh, uh, made his career writing about about the follies of uh, OSU football. But I do think that there is a point at which the quantity of money involved really did make a qualitative shift 
in the kinds of issues that we're talking about. Because 100 years ago, when Columbia and the University of Pennsylvania were hiring, you know, goons off the loading docks to come uh, play <laughs> football for them, the, the money involved was so trivial. Uh, and now, every, you know, the, every university president who is uh, ahead of one of these uh, sports behemoths is, is just terrified of running afoul of alumni donors and of network executives and ESPN contracts and so on and so forth. Uh, so now the courts are being, I would say in some cases, reluctantly dragged in to do what uh, the NCAA is not interested in doing and which college and university presidents have proved uh, too cowardly to do, which is which is to sort of you, you know, deal with some of the obvious contradictions and the obvious corruptions here, uh, and they have simply stuck their heads further and further in the stand. So now we're in the courts. With these kind of cultural ideas and legacy in mind, and even this current financial situation you bring up, Steve, we're curious what sorts of solutions can we begin to craft in order to address these problems, and what from history might inform these decisions? Well, you know, I've said for a long time that, uh, and I've mostly said this, you know, over a pitcher of beer, uh, but uh, <laughs> that that the extraordinary thing about college athletics, and and again, let's let's really talk about men's basketball and football because mm-hmm. because everything else is kind of drafting in the wake yeah. of those. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's really remarkable is that two multi-billion dollar entertainment industries have persuaded American higher education to provide them with their minor leagues for free. Uh, Baseball runs its own minor league system, hockey runs its own minor league system, and yet the rest of the higher education is doing that for the NFL. And that we ought to just calve off uh, the football operations and make them semi-professional, make them minor leagues, go into some partnership with the NFL to to have the uh, OSU football team, I don't know, be the, the farm system for the Cleveland Browns or something along those lines. Because at this point, I don't see any solutions that, uh, that rein in this beast. Uh, I think we just have to let it run away. Um, I would maybe push back just slightly, Steve, on the verb persuaded. Uh, not that that I might not share your uh, a personal desire for that particular solution, but but this gets at what I was talking a little bit earlier about how really far back you can push these things mm-hmm. because uh, your description of of contemporary college football was accurate in the twenties before the NFL was a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. That's um, fair. And um, I think critics of college football tend to underestimate how genuinely organically a part of the image of the institution it is. Yep. Uh, let me tell uh, what I suspect Steve will consider a depressing story about the history <laughs> about the history of the University of Chicago. Yes. I will compare uh, late 19th century to Chicago to contemporary Texas. In that late 19th century, Chicago was full of people who were convinced the rest of the country was unaware of how great Chicago was. Uh, and so, and they and they looked around in 1891 around Chicago, and they didn't see a Yale. They didn't see a college yep. equal to the quality of the city. And so they rustled up a bunch of Rockefeller money, and they built a college from scratch. And the first guy they hired was a president uh, uh, who had previously been a professor from Yale, whose name was uh, William Rainey Harper, I believe. Yep. Um, the second guy they hired was Amos Alonzo Stagg. <laughs> second guy they hired. Um, and they made him a full professor of physical education to coach the basketball and football teams. And at the first week, literally the first week of classes at the University of Chicago in 1892, Stagg called a mass meeting, which is something they used to do on colleges where he literally said, everybody come to the gymnasium, where they voted, Steve, on what they wanted their class yell to be at the football games. (laughs) And that was... That was, was it in f- Latin, at least? I, I, no, it was not. It was not in Latin. Um, and that was the first thing the University of Chicago, yeah. and, and, and there's evidence in the archives of Harper saying we're going to get a football team and everybody's going to know us. Yeah. And, yeah, if, yeah, you, yeah. and if, you were to, if you were to go down the list of the U.S. News and World Reports of the top 20, 30, 40 prestigious institutions of higher education in this country, in order to name colleges that either are not currently or never were – places where where they contained college football, your criticism of which was accurate. Uh, you got MIT, uh, Johns Hopkins, 
Yep. Give or take what you think of their lacrosse program. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Caltech. Yep. And, and that's pretty much the end of the list. And, and so it's, it's organic to the institution in a way that I think it's – when we talk about uh, whether or not we got to put a crowbar in there and, and pry it off the institution, mm-hmm. I think that conversation sometimes underestimates how well, organically yeah. buried it is in the institution. So, so you, that, that's a great story, uh, and yes, I find it uh, deeply depressing. <laughs> But let's, let's add the footnote to it, which is that sometime in the 1940s, the University of Chicago decided to get out of the Big Ten. There are two off-ramps. And um, one thing that, that – one way to actually have the conversation about how can we divorce major college football from the institution is maybe not to think in terms of prying it off entirely, but what kind of off-ramps are available? Is it possible for an institution – to decide to walk away on its own right. without destroying its institutional concept of itself. Yep. And there are only two off-ramps historically. One is the University of Chicago in the late 30s that just abolished it. Mm-hmm. And by the late 30s, the University of Chicago had basically begun to eat a different kind of prestige, and they'd begun to think of their self-image as being how selective they were. And, and, they, and they started counting Nobel Prizes. And they started counting Nobel Prizes. Mm-hmm. And it's also the case, Steve, that when they got rid of football, there was, A, a lot of, a lot of uh, alumni anger. They really did have to, have to uh, shout down all the people that you'd have to shout down today. And they basically decided to abolish it entirely rather than play, you know, rather than just care about it less yeah. on the grounds that if we're not going to be the best at this, we don't want to do it at all. Do it at all. Right, right, right. And the, other, the only other off-ramp is the Ivy League, which uh, after World War II began, they didn't get rid of, of college football altogether. And in fact, the Ivy League today has a, a, in some ways, in terms of participation, percentage of the student body participating in athletics, some of the Ivy League athletic programs are the largest athletic programs in the country. Right. But they decided to gradually disinvest their own image in that. And they did it, too, because they began to invest their self-image more heavily in their iviness, in their eliteness, mm-hmm. in their, mm-hmm. in their selectivity. Mm-hmm. But it might be productive to have a conversation about the circumstances under which, oh, you know, we, here in Ohio, we live in the middle of the Mid-American Conference. Right. It's Bowling Green and Toledo. Yep. and Ball State that can't afford college football, right. but are deathly afraid that if they were to get rid of it, we would not think of them as the same kind of institution. And if I were uh, genuinely interested in achieving less of a connection between major amateur athletics and the educational system, I think I might try to put the thin end of the wedge uh, uh, down there. And, and I think this is a great segue into our final question. Um, and another important component or issue to consider here that we've really already been touching on is how these college sports affect higher education as a whole, which we've kind of been discussing a little bit here. Um, and so in your experiences, how have sports impacted the university? And Anna, if you want to take us off first here. Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, I think that, uh, I think that you hear a lot of different stories, uh, regarding this particular question, like, uh, stories that students enroll in a particular campus, not because it's the best college fit for them, but because they want to participate in the sports culture of that university. I see a lot of that here at Ohio State. Uh, (laughs) you know, students want to be Buckeye fans. They want to experience the culture of the football, you know, Saturdays and whatnot. Um, Is it possible for an institution to have a big time football or basketball program and, uh, and, and also have high graduation rates of, of those students? Um, is it possible? I think it maybe is. Uh, and one of the things actually that convinced me of that was, uh, University of Pennsylvania study on, um, the involvement of, of black males in, in college football and college, college basketball. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah, Ohio State graduates 38% of its black male athletes, uh, which is just outside the top 10 lowest in the country um, out of the, the, the biggest earning conferences. Northwestern, on the other hand, uh, is the highest at 81%. Wow, which is higher than the rate for its, for, for its, its student body. It's possible. But of course, is Northwestern going to be the ultimate college football power like in Alabama? No, it's not. 
But I think that schools have to make those types of decisions for themselves. I think that um, on, on some level, if, 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 if uh, it can certainly be um, a corrosive force on campus, I think that it, uh, 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 as Steve mentioned at the very beginning of this of this podcast, um, I think there, there's a lot of cascade effects uh, regarding uh, rape culture on campus, regarding uh, cultures of entitlement, regarding graduation rates. I mean, however you want to look at this. Um, um, there can be negative effects, but I think that too there can be positive elements. Um, I think that that individual programs are going to have to make some very tough decisions, uh, regardless of of what alumni think or not. <laughs> right, right. Um, that's eventually what it's going to have to come down to. And now I'm, I'm cynical enough to to understand that not all programs are going to be able to make those types of decisions. But uh, but but at, at some point, you know, we're kind of reaching the critical mass in that. Let's play this little thought experiment for a moment. You um, you show up on a campus uh, like the like the protagonist in the Music Man uh, to a board of trustees meeting. And you say, "I got a program for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to run in the red every single year. It's going to lower your admission standards, and it's going to increase the incidence of campus violence." Doesn't that sound great? Let's let's do that. Well, that's college athletics <laughs> at most places. Um, <laughs> There are there are, are a handful of, of places uh, like Ohio State which run this thing in the black, but in order to do that, they have essentially sold themselves in every conceivable way that they can sell themselves uh, to to Nike and to ESPN and to uh, God knows what else. The vast vast majority of places, Division three places and so on, are running in the red. It does have a distorting effect. The the Knight Foundation studied this so probably ten or fifteen years ago now um, on the admissions process. If you are a high school athlete, you it's this is the new affirmative action. Um, you, you get you get admitted now because the coach needs a lacrosse player uh, to play goalie. Uh, uh, the, the football coach needs a place kicker. So I really do think it, it has had this extraordinary ripple effect, um, even at places that aren't big time. I don't disagree with any of that, but again, I can think of, of so many early 20th century examples of the same question that I come back to, to the organicism. And yeah. And and I would make the point since we all work at a at at an institution like this, I would just not not to argue against anything that Steve has just said, but I would just make the observation that institutions such as this make a wide variety of economically uh, irrational decisions out of peer matching. Yes, that's right. Jones uh, keeping up with Jones. Keeping up with Jones, especially when Jones is actually <laughs> three steps ahead and everyone knows it. Yep. And and I would argue that that this ha- this is the explanation for why so many institutions in in intercollegiate athletics has behaved uh, uh, have behaved in this way. Uh, I was I did some research at Oberlin, Oberlin's athletic program in the 1890s. Oberlin's need to be seen as equal to Yale, yeah, is both the explanation and it's the most powerful explanation when it's when it's obviously false. Bowling Green can't admit that it can't support football. Right. And, and I would just observe that, that these institutions that make a wide variety of, of economically unsensible decisions based on similar ideas of, of our psychology department needs to be equal to X psychology department, our, our, uh, our library needs to be of equal quality to, uh, to Y library. Uh, Ohio State recently built a beautiful new gymnasium where you can get pretty good sushi. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm not convinced that uh, uh, produces knowledge either. (laughs) But but we got to have it because Michigan's got it. Right. Um, And and I think that's the I think that's a powerful explanatory force and not just in the world of athletics. Well, Mark, I have to say that uh, you, your point regarding economically irrational decisions, I think, explains for me why I am not allowed to have an office phone here at the university. <laughs> <laughs> you tell them, tell them uh, how many office phones there are uh, in the classics department at Michigan State. Yeah. And, that's how, and that's how you can get a dean to pony up for phones. Uh, and so it's, there are more zeros on the end of all the checks when we talk about college football. Than when we talk about some of these other things, but I'm I'm slightly more skeptical, I think, than some other people are who are interested in this. That 
all of this is either unique to sport or being driven primarily by the TV money. Uh, I think that explains the size of the, you yeah. know, the the size of the bill rolls involved, but I'm not convinced that it's the only institutional explanation for the for the behavior and decision making. Well, if I could jump in here for a second, I think that I think that you're bringing up Oberlin was a very interesting point because uh, one of the things I discuss in the in the Origins article is the uh, athletic director in, at Oberlin in 1929 wrote uh, a sort of an opinion piece in which he decried the commercialism that was overtaking college sport. And one of the things that he particularly pointed to was the erection in the 1920s um, of very large stadiums mm-hmm. across, all across yeah. the country. Country. Yeah. Uh, yep. OSU Horseshoe was one of those, the Big LA way, Coliseum, yeah. um, Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and what he was essentially identifying was the change from college football as a sport to college football as a spectacle. Uh, a spectacle in which the fans, the alumni, the students, the players, etc., everyone seems to have a much larger stake uh, in that in 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 college football as a spectacle than as a simple uh, amateur sport in which you know fine blooded young men get to you know learn moral values. Paradoxically, the the world of of 1920s stadium construction that 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 he was decrying was actually a product of an earlier reform where people in the 1890s said, this is too commercial. People are going drunk and, you know, people are (laughs) getting drunk and going to these games that have nothing to do with Yale. We have to bring this on campus. And that's why the stadiums got built on the campus. That was already an attempted reform of an earlier discussion about how college football was way too commercial. Um, but I think, too, I mean, if it, if it does become, you know, if the antitrust succeeds and it does become, you know, more of that survival of the fittest, then I think uh, then I think you know, that could have a positive effect on some schools like Grambling State, um, which uh, has been essentially bankrupt. I mean, they're in financial straits uh, anyway uh, as a university, yep. but uh, but they continue to hold on to their football team, which means that they have to they can't afford to fly anywhere. So. They have to bust the players everywhere, yeah, even if that's, that's yeah, that's, yeah that's even if that's cool, like yeah. a twenty-four hour trip one way and twenty-four hours the other way. Which Steve brings up your other point about the corrosive nature on higher education. Mm-hmm. These kids yep. are exhausted by the time yeah, they get no to campus. There's no way they're doing any work. Yeah. yeah, there's no way they're doing any work, and they have yep. to miss an enormous amount of class because of that. So I think if you get those types of schools that where it's such a financial burden. For whatever reason, if they are forced into giving it up, I think that that can benefit higher education in a lot of ways, too. Yeah, no, that, that might be right. Mm-hmm. This is still not making me feel better, Mark. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, on that, like, wonderful, you know, note of hope, <laughs> we're going to thank Anna McClough, Mark Horger, and Steve Kahn, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today on History Talk for More Origins. Thank you. All right. Thank great, you. great to be here. Thanks. This edition of the Origins Podcast, History Talk, was brought to you by the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at The Ohio State University. Our main editors are Stephen Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Koheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Patrick Payandi and Leticia Wiggins. Song and band information can be found on our website. You can find our podcasts and more at our website, origins.osu.edu, on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Thank you for listening.